This is an addendum to Is God Desirable Part 2. I was hoping to finish the topic, but of course I didn't. Here I'm doing an audio with pictures slapped on to flesh out a little bit more about what that means. First thing that you got to know is what I'm using as a criterion is God desirable as a logic test and therefore an evidentiary test. This mechanism of testing has been in use for thousands of years um, and in today's classification of things it's mostly considered to be the realm of philosophy but actually you can use it as a scientific method of inquiry if you do it right. Now, <clears throat> doing it right means so, something like um, auditing, balancing your checkbook. You can balance your checkbook and leave a couple of entries that you're not sure of alone, um, in which case you've not really balanced your checkbook, but you've gone as far as you wanted to go to prove whatever it was you wanted to prove. Um, that's not scientific, okay? That's a preference. I submit that we need to go all the way, the way science does. You go as far as you can go. Science is always trying to go as far as they can go to answer questions. And then it stops when it can't go any farther. Now, in when you balance a checkbook, there are a finite number of transactions. You have a withdrawal and you have a deposit, essentially. <clears throat> What you need to account for in uh, your bank account is why the deposit is there and why the withdrawal is there. And where did the deposit go or where did the withdrawal go? Where did it come from? Okay? Until you can account all those things, you really don't know if you have the right bank balance. Now, questions that are, how do we want to put it? Questions that require a lot more transactions to view cannot be as completely and conclusively answered as balancing your checkbook. But directions or implications, what scientists like to always say, the data suggests, can be known. The trick is to be very painstaking in doing it. Now, when people believe things, they aren't painstaking. They sort of have an intuitive grasp at best that a thing is true or false, and they buy into it based on their intuition. And sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes people buy into ideas because they just like how it sounds, and they don't want to trouble further with it, which means that there is an emotional affinity based on their own personality to whatever ideas they buy into. Well, that's not a valid criterion for establishing scientific existence. But that doesn't mean that what they bought into is, is incorrect. All right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to dissect and distinguish and divorce, even with using a criterion of desirability, we're trying to divorce emotional affinities. We're trying to divorce sheer preference that doesn't do its full examination. All right, that's a hard thing to do. The reason why we can go about it this way is that the issue of the desirability of God is a universal fact. Okay? It's an empirically a fact for generations, for thousands of years, that people have desired the existence of God in some form. That's, a, that's where it becomes empirical. The fact exists that people do this. Whether God actually exists or not has yet to be determined. But the fact of the desirability exists. All right. So if the fact of the desirability exists, where does it come from? It doesn't come from nature. Nature is not God. Nature is mindless. So where does this idea of God come from? 
Now, this is not the same as some Christians try to argue that because I think it's called Anselm's argument, uh, where because you can conceive of God, therefore He exists. That's not what I'm talking about here. Not at all. It's the opposite in many ways. What we're doing is we're testing the desirability of God that is an empirical fact with the natural universe that we think we understand and that the universe exists is also an empirical fact. We're sort of comparing the two sets of empirical facts to see if beyond them that we can't see there is any kind of empirical pointer to one or more versions of God. That's what we're using it for. It is an empirical test. Now, preview of coming attractions, any kind of empirical test is never going to be conclusive. So if you're an atheist, you're not, your atheism isn't being threatened here. What you're doing is just looking for avenues of what you want to call it, inquiry. That's all you're going to come out, that's all it's going to come out of this. Avenues of inquiry. If God exists, what would make God desirable? Because if God exists, then God is desirable. That's a logical assumption. First part about that assumption would be that if God exists and he made everything, then he desired to do so. If he hated doing so, the universe wouldn't be here. And if he hated what he made, it wouldn't be here. So he must have desired to do it, and he must still desire for it to exist because it's still here. So that leads you to questions about the desirability of God as a person. The desirability of God, I'm, I'm being Greek about this and I shouldn't, subjective and objective genitive. Desirability of God means God's own desires. That's subjective genitive. And then objective genitive, desirability of God, meaning why should we desire him? Is there, is there any, anything that argues for God having desires? Because if he has desires, he exists. And is there anything pointing to why we should want him? Because now you get sort of mildly into Anselm's argument. Why would we want something that, that can't exist? All right, and you can say, well, you know, man wants a lot of imaginary things. Well, not really. I mean, something that's imaginary doesn't mean that something cannot exist. It might mean that it's potential. I mean, mathematics deals with this kind of stuff all day long, so this shouldn't be too much of a, a, a stretch for you to consider it logical to approach the subject of God with the same kind of um, thought processes that you use in theoretical physics or theoretical math of any kind. You end up always, what math, what distinguishes math from the rest of sciences is that math can go into the theoretical. And from the theoretical in math, you can deduce a lot of stuff in natural science. And it actually helps you to do so. If you want to learn things in biology, the first thing you'd really want to do is go into theoretical math and see if there's any kind of set of laws or principles in theoretical math that might explain processes that you can't otherwise explain in biology. Well, now we're just applying that same set of reasoning to the question of God. We have two empirical databases. One, natural law or natural science such as we know it. And then two, the fact that throughout history people have desired God in some form. Now, in order to cut through and shorten and speed up the process of analysis of this possible existence of God, you have to, or you're best off, instead of invoking God as necessary, you're best off invoking is God desirable. Because you're not only solving the question of whether God exists, or you're solving for it, 
you're also solving the question and have to solve the question of which version of God. And so by going straight to, okay, if God exists, what would make God desirable? If God exists and God created this universe, uh, what would make him want to do that? And what would make me want him? That's going to narrow your universe of God definitions quite a bit. In fact, it's going to narrow it to basically a, a definition of God that is omnipotent, omnipresent, justice, love, truth, you know, all the standard things that you hear in Christian theology. Because any other definition of God would be, um, what do you want to call it? I think Berlinski's term was contingent. God being a product of something else. Well, if God's a product of something else, then he's not really God. He's just another creature like you, only maybe higher. You see what I'm saying? If God is subject to the laws of nature, then something produced God. What was it? If God has a progenitor, then, then the God that you're saying that has a progenitor isn't really God. Okay, so what qualifies as God? Well, it'd have to be the largest uncontainable set. You see how I'm drawing my reasoning from math? Theoretical math. Largest uncontainable set. I'm a person, therefore the attributes in the largest uncontainable set have to be personhood. Therefore God exists. Because I'm a member of the largest uncontainable set, and I'm a person, and I'm different from nature. My personhood cannot be biologically measured. It's immaterial. Nobody can open up my head and find the thoughts in it. Most that they can do is find out that thought has an effect on the brain, but they can't find thoughts in the brain because thought's not biological. Well, if thought's not biological, that would account for why I have desires for something beyond nature, namely God. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean that God exists, but it certainly means that something about me is beyond nature. So how did that component of the me get there? All right. So you have to back into it by saying, okay, what would make God desirable? And what would make God desire the universe that we see? What does that tell you about the hypothetical nature of God if God existed? So then you're narrowing down the definition of God at the same time that you're narrowing down the path you need to research to prove the existence of God. I mean, it's kind of like, until I describe to you what a Corvette on the freeway looks like, you have no basis for reference. Once I've described it to you and you actually see it on the freeway, then you know what a Corvette looks like and I don't have to prove it to you anymore. You've seen it yourself. But until you've seen it yourself, my description of what a Corvette looks like isn't really going to make entire sense to you. You have to see it yourself. Well, same thing's true of God, or pretty much anything else. You know, I went to school in Hong Kong. Okay, well, if you've never been to Hong Kong, there's just a bunch of pictures that you see on the internet, or maybe a webcam, which would be much more definitive, or something you heard about. But until you actually go there, you don't have the experience of Hong Kong that I had. And, of course, my experience of Hong Kong was over 30 years ago. So the Hong Kong today is not the same Hong Kong as it was. So you're still taking it on faith what I say about Hong Kong, let alone anything else. You see what I'm saying? We Christians are evidence of God in the sense that we actually know him. We have direct contact with him. But why should you believe us? You shouldn't. At most, what you can take from our so-called testimony is that it's plausible that God exists in some form. Okay, but isn't there a better way to test for the existence of God than that? Oh, sure there is. The number one fastest, easiest, most conclusive way to test for God is ask the ceiling, Hey God, this is a really confusing question. I need proof you exist. Please prove it to me directly, yourself, with direct contact. That's what all of us have done who are Christians. We don't believe what we believe absent reason. 
We also don't believe what we believe absent direct contact. You have to have both reasoning and direct contact because the reasoning alone isn't going to carry you to proof, conclusive proof of existence. Until you go to Hong Kong, you really don't know it exists. All you got to live on is hearsay. Until you get direct contact from God, you don't know he really exists and you certainly don't know who he really is. The most you can do is sort of reason out hypothetically. Well, that's not enough. And God isn't expecting it to be enough. He's not expecting you to live on reason alone or empiricism alone. Neither reason nor empiricism is going to be the conclusive proof. But it gets you on the road. So that when you get contact from God, you can test that contact with reason and with empiricism. You need all three. Now... Science is not going to be able to rule on direct contact from God, even though there is a welter of empirical evidence from time immemorial of individuals claiming direct contact from God. That, too, is an empirical fact that individuals have made those claims. I'm making the claim, too. I get contact from God every day, even when I don't want it. And then I have to use 1 John 1 9. Okay, but why should you believe me? That's not enough evidence. That's maybe no evidence at all as far as you're concerned, and rightly so. You need to contact yourself. So, you need direct contact, and then you need reasoning to, do, to test the contact you think you got. And then you need some kind of reflection of that reasoning in the empirical natural creation that God allegedly created that you can see. And it all has to be harmonious. If you don't have all three, you don't have proof. That's why I support atheism. Until an atheist, an atheist is an atheist because he doesn't have all those three things. It's a question of whether he wants to find them. And that's up to him. If you're an atheist, you cannot call yourself objective until you've pursued all three things. But you still have the right to be one. So you're not ready to prove all those three things. Okay, fine. There's a whole lot of things about God I don't like either. But I can't pretend I don't have proof. You can, because you're not looking for it. I looked for it, I got the proof, and now I don't like it. But I can't pretend I don't have it. You can fine. I'm not going to sit here and condemn you for the fact that you don't want to look. But you can't call yourself object objective until you have the proof. Okay. So be an atheist. And you should be an atheist if you don't have the proof. All three types. Direct contact, reason, and empirical evidence that you can see out in the world. Until all those three things exist to your own satisfaction, then you should be an atheist or whatever else it is you want to be. Because scientifically, until you have proof, you should not believe. Peace out.